everyone. I'm Nathan Gold, Chief Coach at The Demo Coach. I hail from Fremont, California, out by San Francisco, and I'm happy to be here as part of the next program to help you in your communication. I travel around the world working with entrepreneurs and executives, helping them learn how to communicate the value of what they do and why people should care. And starting with that, one of the most important things that I find is the weakest part of most people's presentations tend to be the opening. Or it tends to be when you're asked, so what do you do? And the response to that question is often flat, non-memorable, too simple, it's every day. So what I'd like to talk to you here about in the next seven to ten minutes is a couple of things that you can use when you're meeting people for the first time, when you're opening up your presentation to an investor, or maybe to a customer, or even a friend that you're trying to communicate to them what you do. Let's start with one of my most favorite topics, and that is how to captivate any audience in less than 30 seconds. Now, this is normally a half-day workshop that I'm going to condense down to just a couple of minutes. So I won't be able to put all the information in here that I normally put in. But I do want to share with you my acronym that will help you remember some new tools, or actually some old tools, that you'll be able to use in your everyday presentation needs and communication. And here it is. F-A-M-E. Now, I call this the five-in-one tool. There are five tools in one word here that you can remember so that whenever you need to do a presentation, you'll have these tools readily available to use. I said five. There's actually two S's. So here we go. I'm going to take you through what each of these letters mean really quickly without, letting, without giving you all the kind of information that it would normally in a workshop because we don't have time. So the first S stands for, oh, before I tell you what it stands for, I want to tell you that the number one way to captivate anyone's attention anywhere on the planet, no matter where you are, this is not even a cultural thing, is with this first M. And all you need to do, and it doesn't even take 30 seconds, it might only take two or three seconds. All you need to do is start telling a story. When you stand up in front of a group and you start by saying, so I just want to begin by relating a short story that happened just last week, so long as it's relevant, of course, that story will automatically engage the audience's brain because everyone is wired for story. We love stories. So forget the agenda slide. Just start with a story. Just like Steve Jobs did at the 2008 commencement ceremony at Stanford University where he stood up at the lectern. And he said, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I have three stories I want to share with you here today. And then he told three stories. Every 10 presentations are stories, stories, stories. The best part of stories? People repeat them. I asked Adam Draper from the Draper University just last week. I said, Adam, how many people do you see in a week when you're looking for a new cool cohort of entrepreneurs? He says, oh, around 300. 300? How are you supposed to remember 300? How are you going to stand out in a mind like an Adam Draper? Or any investors, that may matter. Story will do it. You know what Adam's answer was? Let me tell you this story about this one company. And he told the story about this one company. So out of 300, the one that told the story that was most memorable is the one that who was top of mind. So I recommend stories, big time. The next S, A, and M are kind of all related. I'm going to take you back to grade school for a moment here and talk to you about things like, have any of you been in the zero-grab plane where you, you're floating when you're up there? Like, you have no gravity. Most of you haven't. But if I, if I talk to somebody who did it, they would be able to tell me what it's like, meaning it's like floating, or it's like falling, or it's not. You know, so by using the word like, what you're doing is using a simile to help me understand what it is like, because I don't understand. Maybe I'll never experience it, but by using the word like, using a simile, you can help people understand anything, anything in life can be done through a simile. And if you have a complex topic to try to get people to understand, you need to be starting to use simile to help people get it. And when you say what the simile is, the right side of the simile on the like side, you should be using something that's so familiar to people, like a chair, a table, a tree, a building, a, a car, anything that is top of, that people understand, use in your similes, and they'll get it. If you ever have something that's complex and people go, huh? Use a simile, and they'll get it. 
The next letter A has a little story behind it. And this comes from a CEO that I asked, well, what do you do? And he said, Nathan, we do for surfing what the chairlift does for snow skiers. Okay, interesting. He said, you know, the problem with snow skiing is getting to the top of the mountain and the chairlift fixes that problem. Well, the problem with surfing is getting out to the waves. And we fix that problem with an electric surfboard. It has a little wireless controller that goes on your thumb. Off you go. Get out to the wave or press the button and get ahead of the wave. So what did he do there? He used the old familiar analogy. That's what the A stands for. The analogy where you're comparing two things together helps anybody understand the value of that comparison by what you compare it to. So you can do the same thing with software, with hardware, with services, or anything. Now, what that CEO did not do, what most of you try to do, is come up with one sentence that literally describes what you do, that communicates the value of what you do. And I'm here to suggest to you that the first words out of your mouth when you meet somebody for the first time and they say, so what do you do? It shouldn't be necessarily a literal thing, a literal description of what you do. Try to come up with something more interesting, a simile or an analogy that you can use that people will never, ever, ever forget. Finally, the M out of the three. The M, there's a quick story that goes with that, too. At the IBM Smart Camp Finals about a year ago, one of the 12 companies stood up on the stage and they started out by saying, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time today. I'm thrilled to be here to share with you our machine that we built that turns water into money. He paused. And everybody in the room started cracking up, laughing. Yeah, right, sure, sure, sure. But in one sentence, using some very visual words, he got everybody in the room captivated. And what did he do? He used the M. And the M stands for a metaphor. And a metaphor can be one of the most powerful things you can do in your business or in your presentation, because it will help people remember. It will ground them. They'll never forget that. Years later, you run into people where you use a strong metaphor and say, what do you remember about that conference? Oh, that guy that said he can turn water into money. And then finally, the E. The E is the place that all of you typically go to when you're trying to describe what you do to people. And the E stands for examples. So you say, when somebody doesn't understand what you're doing, you say, well, let me give you an example. And all you do is then give some example. And you hope, you hope that that example will actually communicate the value of what you're providing. Often it doesn't. Because examples are sometimes quite narrow. Well, all you need to do to your examples to make them come to life and be even more fun for you to tell is start adding similes, analogies, and metaphors into your examples. And that will help those examples be even stronger in the mind of your listener. So there you have it. Five tools all in one. Stories, similes, analogies, metaphors, and examples. Using the same word, you'll never forget these tools as long as you live, I promise you. All right. Number two. Albert Moravian out of UCLA did a study in the 60s to try to break down what happens in communication. And he quantitative and qualitatively studied this and produced a, a report that many of you have probably heard of. I know it's really old, but so is a lot of things, including me. But he broke it down into three main components when you communicate or when you present. So out of the words, your voice, and your facial expressions that you use when you're presenting, what percentage do you think of the message that people get from you come from your words. We don't have time to interact right now, but I'll tell you, it's 7%. Very small percentage of the message people receive from you comes from your words. I know that sounds pretty incredible to believe, but hear me out here. Your voice makes up 38% of the message that people get from you when you speak. And your facial expressions make up more than half. Now, back in the 60s, we had these lecterns that stood up to here, so we only had the face. Today, we call this body language, okay? So you can see here that 93% of the message that people get from you are not coming from the word, but they're coming from how you're delivering those words. So one of the things that's often missing in most people's presentations, especially with investors, where you're stressed out and you're up there on stage, maybe in front of a couple of hundred or a couple of dozen people, 
You just drop your enthusiasm. You leave it at home. You check it in the car. And that, to me, is one of the biggest pieces of, of a presentation that is missing from most investor presentations and also customer presentations. You need to let your enthusiasm be part of your presentation. And the way to communicate your enthusiasm is not by jumping up and down and waving your arms all over the place, although some people can get away with that. But your enthusiasm comes from your voice. You can play with the tone, the speed, the volume. There's so much you can do with your voice to communicate your passion and your enthusiasm, maybe a little bit in the way I'm doing it with my topic right now with you. If I present, if I talk to my wife and kids like I'm talking to you right now in this video, they kick me out of the house because I'm like too over the top. But hopefully my level of enthusiasm is keeping your attention. And that's what you want out of your audience, isn't it? Okay, finally, let's talk about nervousness because I want to wrap up here. And I know that one of the top questions I get from clients all over the world is, Nathan, I'm so nervous. I have to go up there in front of 200 people. I'm scared to death. I don't, what do I do? All right, so let me give you three things you can do with those nerves, all right? So the number one thing that I suggest you do when you're nervous, especially when you're going out to do a really important presentation, high-stakes presentations as I call them, very important, you start believing that presentations are very much like a sport. In fact, I believe, metaphorically speaking, presentations are a sport. Communicating is a sport. That's a metaphor, right? So would you go out and just do your sport? Probably not. You do a little bit of warm-up. Whatever that warm-up is, you would do it. So when you're going to do a really important presentation, warm-up. You may never have heard this before, but you need to warm up your voice box. And to do that, all you need to do is go sing, hum, go out in the car and talk to yourself for a few minutes. Just warm up your voice. Singing works really well because singing and humming gets your voice to use all the different registers that you might use, and then when you go to present, it's all ready. That's number one, is warm up. A couple hours before, a few minutes before, a couple hours before works really, really well. The second thing, really, really important about being nervous, is that when you're stressed or nervous, your physiology changes. You actually slow down your breathing. You might actually stop breathing. I've seen people get so nervous that they literally stop breathing for a couple of Seconds, and then they go, oh, wow, I was really nervous. So one of the things that you need to remember here, number two, is breathe. You literally need to remind yourself to breathe because you're not, when you're stressed, when you're nervous, you're not breathing very well. And when I'm talking about breathing, I'm talking about bringing the breath down into the abdomen, not just these high short breaths which will continue to make you nervous and not help you with all the adrenaline flowing through your body. So a couple of deep breaths down into the abdomen. When you know you're next and you're being introduced and you're walking up to the lectern, a couple of breaths, you can actually feel your body thank you for bringing that oxygen back into your brain. So breathe. If you have to write the word breathe on your palm, do it. So as you get up there and you're ready to go, you look down and you go, breathe and go. One more thing about breathing. If you really, really are frightened about speaking in front of people and the nerves are taking over, like so, making you so scared, Google combat breathing or tactical breathing. And tactical breathing can be used to help you get your brain back where it should be, which is in the now versus scared to death and not knowing what to do. Finally, in terms of some things you can do when you're nervous, my favorite all-time thing to do is dealing with what I call, it's an excuse. You know, people always tell me, hey, just give me a minute or two and I'll be warmed up. Well, to me that's an excuse because the first minute or two of your presentation is probably one of the most important minutes in the presentation. So if you need a minute to warm up and you get up there and you go, okay, I'm up, I'm up, and then and then you come to life, it's like too late. Oh, it's too late, especially when you have two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, eight minutes, or some short period of time that you need to present. So here's my secret, all-time secret.
that you can use to instantly get you in a state of mind where the first words out of your mouth sound as compelling and as memorable as the last word? And the answer is, with music. Music, it's an amazing thing. For me, personally, whenever I have to go present, I instantly turn on some music in my head. What am I listening to? It's not that important. But you need to find a piece of music that when you hear the first bit, the first few seconds, it instantly transforms you into the state of mind you want to be in. I'll share with you what mine is. Back in 1976, there was a movie that came out called Rocky. Most of you have probably heard of it. The theme song from the first movie, not the Eye of the Tiger, that was the second movie. The first movie, that theme song, bop, 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 that's all I need to hear in my head, and my body changes. I'm in exactly the frame of mind I want to be in to present. I recommend all of you find a piece of music that's inspiring to you. And as soon as you need to get into that mood, that frame of mind where you need to present, turn the music on in your head, and you will see a difference in how you present, and you'll see a difference in how people respond to you. So thank you very much. I'm out of topic for today, probably a little over time, and I really appreciate the time here today. I look forward to working with you more in the future. Please feel free to reach out to me at Nathan at DemoCoach.com. Thank you.